Now, you speak with what? What's like the? How did it lead to to? You had little steps. This happened. That happened. But ha what's like a short summary of how you got to where you are now? Where you were? Uh, was it well, all really, word of mouth and it just built up? Built yeah, up. Yeah, really. Yeah, a bit of everything. I mean, obviously, I went from making the posters up by I used to cut the photographs of the acts out of um, things like Time Out magazine or the Guardian Guide. I'd cut photos out and make the poster as a sort of collage of photographs of the acts and cut even, I'd even cut words out of newspapers like, see this act in separate words. So it looked like a serial killer had written it almost, you know, because it was different words in different fonts to make my posters and then would get a master that I'd made and then photocopy four to them and then post them to the venue in an envelope. This is all what was going 97, 98, 99, no social media, no email, email just started about 99, 2000 properly, hardly, hardly at all. A lot of people didn't even have emails, addresses still in 99. So I was literally making posters in the local photocopier shop who I had an account with because I was always skinned and the guy knew me and I said, can I pay this noise? All right, so, yeah, I know you'll be back. I said, oh, 10 pounds. And I'd photocopy 40 copies of a black and white poster I'd made myself at home by cutting photos out of comedians and sticking them onto, onto a poster and making it myself with no technology and then just making 40 and posting it to them and then they put that all around their venue around the town and that's how we sell it. Some of those posters still exist. There's a few people have got a few copies left somewhere, I'll, which I've never really put up because, well, they look ridiculous now. They look so old-fashioned and crazy. But some of them had acts like Mickey Flanagan, supported by Jimmy Carr, were, were the sort of bills I was having, made, and my posters were made like that for those lineups. Just Danny Boy was the open spot. It's just madness. But anyway, the point is uh, how I did it, really, Marvin, to be honest, it's, and it gets back to advice, which anybody might want later on in this podcast, is that... Um, I worked like an absolute maniac. I just worked seven days a week, seven days a week, all the time. I, I just worked all the time on comedy. I didn't really do anything else. I just booked comedians. I did gigs. I did 330 gigs a year for the first three years. So I did 996 gigs or something in the first three years, um, just under a thousand um, in the first three years. I gigged six nights a week, sometimes seven, sometimes I do 20 nights in a row. I went to Newcastle and back for an open spot, which was seven hours driving each way. And I did six minutes. I did. I went to Leeds for an open spot, five minutes. I drove to Sheffield and back for a five minute open spot. All these journeys were six hours, five hours each way from where I lived. And I had a very old car that only just worked. Uh, I broke down on the way to gig several times and managed to get the thing running again and get there. I mean, I stayed in B&Bs that were so bad that people, I, I stayed in a BnB and b in Liverpool once where when I got to the venue, and uh, I just left my case there and gone straight to the venue. And the guy said, where are you staying? And I, went, I gave him the name of the road. And he said, Christ, you know, I mean, he was he was from Liverpool. Obviously, I won't attempt the accent, but he said, you're mad staying there. He said, why? I said, it was £12 for the room. He said, I'm not surprised. He said, are there iron bars on the windows? I said, yeah, actually, there are. I, I thought that was weird. He said, that's because every house in that street has iron bars on the windows. It's like notorious drug gang area. It's the worst part of town, you, you know, nobody wants to go there, let alone stay there overnight. I said, well, there's anything I could get for 12 pounds, I'm not surprised. So that's, I just did it by driving a very old car that hardly worked, staying in horrendously horrible hostels and hotels and working on almost zero budget and killing myself night after night for years and years. That's how I did it. And then that enabled me to become a professional comedian by just getting better over a very long period and getting paid and having to be able to stop staying in the cheapest B&B or and, and, and upgrade to a slightly better car, et cetera, and gradually moved up. But then the booking was word of mouth at the beginning, because again, no social media, nothing. So it was all word of mouth because we didn't have social media. So basically it was, I'd book two clubs and then another guy would say, oh, do you book those two clubs? Well, I've got a club, great. And it literally was that, it literally snowballed. I had three clubs, then another guy was say, can you book mine for? Then another guy would say, I've got two clubs, that'd be six. Another guy said, I run three pubs, can you do all three? I'd say, yeah, that's great, that'll be nine. And I just built until eventually I went over the 100 club mark. I haven't got 100 now, post-COVID, of course. Let's cut it back. I mean, I've got a good number, but it, that COVID's put a bit of a train through that. You know, it's uh, so some of my clubs aren't even reopened yet or are somewhere under during COVID, but obviously I've also opened some new clubs since COVID. But anyway, the point is I went from the one club in Plymouth to hundred clubs, but that was probably in the space of about six years, I suppose, probably from 97 to 2003, I went from zero to about a hundred, but I was a workaholic, you know, in a bad way, really. 
I worked a bit too much. Um, I literally would spend all day Sunday, you know, phoning people, trying to do deals, you know, networking, even even through a landline or through a, from a phone box or whatever I had. I got a mobile phone, obviously, after a few years, and then once I could use that, that was fine. But I'd literally be on the phone calling people, uh, yeah, and then I'd get a lead. Someone would say, I've got a friend who's got a pub. I think he wants comedy, and I wouldn't just leave it. I'd go in and say, right, you know, would you like it? I'll come and see you. So I just went mad, you know, I, so I chased leads. You know, I didn't obviously just sit there and wait for people to hand me 100 clubs. I, you know, I'd get leads that were 50-50 and think, well, I'm going to bring the guy and ask. And he'd say, yeah, yeah, actually, I was thinking of comedy. Do you want to come and see the room? I'd say, yeah, I'll come see the room. And then if I, we went, well, it's okay. Well, let's book a couple of shows and we'll see how it goes. So, um, so I just did it by working myself into the ground, really. I mean, I don't work at that rate now. I, I couldn't do it. Uh, the rate I worked at then, I, I literally couldn't do it now. I mean, it's funny. I mean, I'm sure it applies to other people. Perhaps it's like, I don't know, sports people or anybody where they achieve something. And then people say, how did you do all that training? And they probably say, actually, if somebody asked me to start now, I wouldn't do it. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes when you're in the moment of doing it, you can just push yourself on. But if you sit back afterwards and think what you did, you think, how in the hell did I do that? Because I just couldn't face it now. I couldn't possibly face it now. I used to live in Bath and I used to get a walk to the station which was about a mile and a half, uh, maybe a mile. And then I'd get a train, which was an hour and 40 minutes. And then I'd get the underground for half an hour. And then I'd get into a club and do a five minute spot, open spot. Then I'd get another 40, you know, 40 minutes back to Paddington on the tube. And then I'd do another hour and 40 minutes back to Bath and get back to Bath at two in the morning on the last train back and then walk home and get home at half past two. And I'd do the same the next night and the next night and the next night. Night after night, I'd be leaving at 6.30, walking to the station, hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, another half an hour on the tube, a five minute spot back. So back at two, two, it's quarter past two in the morning, back up the next day, same thing on the train. That weekend gap for five minute spots, sometimes all open mic nights, sometimes five minute spots on bills that weren't amazing and only 15 people turn up. Just, I could not possibly think about doing it now. But then the whole point is when you're hungry and you're new and you're fired up, you can do that. Clearly, I'm now I'm in a very different position where I'm sort of running clubs and managing comics and doing decent, well-paid work. You know, I, I don't need to do it, so I don't do it, and nobody else does. I mean, all the acts that came through with me, you know, the one that are either professional, not all of them, but a lot of professionals, or some of them, of course, are famous. And uh, Michael McIntyre was running a little club in Richmond when I first met him, which he co convent himself, you know. Um, I don't think you're going to find him opening a small club in Richmond now. So what I mean is, obviously, at the time, Daniel Kitson was crazy. He, he was worth more than me, and which I found hard to believe because I was a bit full on. But uh, I remember talking to Daniel once and he said, how many gigs do you do this month? I said, 28, because I had, because I that month I'd gone a bit crazy. And I remember him saying, lightweight, I've done 30. And I said, well, it is a 31 day month, Daniel. So you must have had a night off because obviously we were having a bit of banter because he was so <laughs> keen to impress upon me that he'd done more than I had so I said well you did have one night off Daniel because it was there were 31 days this month so clearly you've done 30 on a night off but D Daniel Kitson would literally gig almost every night every month almost every night and the other person that did that was Jimmy Carr Jimmy Carr would gig every single night if anybody with, and do any gig anywhere when he started so he went to Chesterfield for me and opened a show for nothing doing 20 minutes that's one of the reasons Jimmy Carr made it because he was pragmatic and he knew how things worked. And he realized that, of course, you have to be able to afford to do that. I mean, if somebody physically can't afford to go to Chesterfield and do a gig for nothing, then they can't do it. Um, but he had put himself in a position where he had some money saved up specifically with the target of becoming a professional in about a year, approximately, is how he worked. And he'd done the fives and tens for me, uh, open spots. And I had a gig in Chesterfield where the guy said, I've only got £100 for the whole show. And I should have said no. I mean, a lot of promoters would say, just say no, Jeff. I mean, he wants a proper show for that, not open mic night. He wants a full professional show. But I thought, well, if I close it, because by then I had 30 minutes, I thought, if I close it myself and I can get an open spot that lives up north or two, and then I can get another act to open it for very little money, I could work to, I could make, I think it was £43 profit. I worked out all the figures, the amount it cost me to get there. I found a B&B &B for 18 pounds, worked out my train, worked out that I could keep the whole 100 pounds if I could find an opener for no money. And so out of the 100 pounds, I'd make 47 pounds profit. 
because it would cost me 53 pounds for the train and B&B. So I said to him, okay, I'll, I'll do it on a Tuesday night in an upstairs room. And I rang Jimmy and said, there's only one person I can think of who might open a show for me for nothing. And that's you. He said, where is it? I said, Chesterfield. He said, how long do you want? I said, 20 minutes. He said, if I do this, will all my future gigs be paid and pay 20s? I said, yes. He said, okay, I'll, I'll come and open it for nothing. So that bill, Jimmy Carr opened for nothing. Justin Morehouse did the open spot because he was a new act at the time from the North and I closed the show and the landlord paid hundred pounds and I made 47. So that's the sort of thing I did. Uh, some people may not approve, you know, I'm sure there's people out there saying, cause I've had these discussions for years rather with people. Some people say, oh, devaluing comedy, you know. They said, you've devalued comedy, Jeff. You've let a guy get a show with Jimmy Carr and Justin Morehouse and you for hundred pounds. Of course, Justin then was a new act, an unknown open spot. And, and even Jimmy wasn't known to the landlord. Even he was still new. But when you look at it retrospectively at how well Jimmy's done and that Justin's very successful, re retrospectively, that bill looks ridiculous for hundred pounds on a Tuesday. But so some people say, well, Jeff, you shouldn't have done it, you know, because it's devaluing comedy. It's like you're even you're working for booking it and doing it for 47 pounds and you've got to go to Chesterfield and back and you've got other people as good as Jimmy doing it for nothing. But I said, I work in, I'm pragmatic. I do what, what's possible. Nobody's ever done a gig for me unless they said they're happy to do it. Nobody. If Jimmy Card said, no, I'm not opening a show for nothing, it wouldn't have happened. If Justin hadn't taken that spot, it wouldn't have happened. If every other gig I run, if somebody goes to Cornwall for me for 50 pounds, it's because they've said they, they're, they'll do it because it's the way it works and people want stage time. And, and I say, look, you don't have to do it. I'm very clear about that. I always say to anybody, if I'm offering a gig in Plymouth for 50 pounds, cash, admittedly, but all the same, and a hotel room, they'll provide you a hotel, but it's not really a hotel, it's a guest house, whatever. It's because that's what they've got. And I'm not, it's not my budget, it's what they've got. And we'd rather have a club there than not. So I'd rather try and book that club. And if you don't want to go to Plymouth, for 50 pounds to do 20 minutes and stay in a guest house and have a few beers don't take it there's no worries i've got no problem with you not taking that totally understand if you say it's not for me don't want it but somebody wants it because there's two or three thousand comics and somebody says i do want it i will take it fine so i own no act has ever done a gig for me against their will and i've run 12,000 shows on books since I started. 12,000 comedy club gigs I've run since I started. I only know the figures because I did a documentary where they asked me for the figures. So I had to work out how many clubs I had, how often they were run. You know, I had to work out all the figures on bits of paper. So I don't know that. It's not an autistic thing where I can just bring up numbers out of the blue. It's purely because I had to work it out. And I know that I've booked over 12,000 gigs since I started. So that's 12,000 gigs on an average budget of 300 pounds, which works out at around 3.4 million pounds worth of income for comedians. Mm -hmm. So I've created 3.4 million pounds worth of income for comedians as a booker. So, but yet you'll still get the argument, Jeff, you shouldn't be offering somebody only 50 quid for Plymouth. I, was, I think, yeah, but look at the overview. You know, the overview is I've created three, nearly three and a half million pounds worth of income for comedians since I was on the dole with no money and behind me my rent. It's where I started from. That's what I've done. So isn't that a good thing that I've come from, Nothing, not being able to afford a car or a phone, landline or anything else, work out the phone box to be creating three and a half million pounds worth of income for communities. Is that not a good thing? They still say it's a good thing, yeah, but I still think it's a bit, bit rich. I was offering someone to go to us. <laughs> Nobody has to take a gig. Nobody has to take a gig for me anywhere, ever. They don't want to take it. They don't have to take it. And it's just I put gigs on and people can take anything they want. And sometimes I'm paying a thousand pounds a night for a closing set. I've got a gig in Horsham. I'm willing to play a closer a thousand pounds for a club gig. That's not a corporate gig. It's not a theatre. It's a club gig. The closing set is a thousand pounds. So I always weigh the whole thing up. Yeah, I've got fifty pound spots in Plymouth uh, with a B and B and a guest house and a few beers thrown in, which some people think is tantamount to an insult to a comedian. But as I said, comics want some comics want it and they go and they go because they want to go, not because I'm making them go. But I'm offering 500 pound closing sets up in Wisbeach. I'm offering a thousand pound closing sets down in Horsham on club shows. Hmm. So you have to look at me in the whole and look at what I do holistically in the whole and think overall is Jeff Whiting offering a wide spectrum and a decent range of gigs? And yes, I am. 
And is he offering more than a lot of promoters ever offer? Yes, I am. Is he also offering less than a lot of promoters offer? Yes, I am. Can we choose which we take? Yes, you can. Yeah. That's simple. So I feel, hopefully, that I've done something good for comedy. Um, apart from what being a comic, which I love, and I'm privileged to be a comic. It's a privilege to be a comic, to be able to make a living doing it. For anybody, however good you are, it's a privilege. Um, but I feel in my other role as a booker, I've done something good for comedy overall. I've made a few mistakes, yes, and I've done a few things people didn't like, yes, but so has every other.